good morning. Yes, I know it's it. <laughs> and well, good morning and welcome to our service this morning. It is very good to see you. Uh, if you're visiting us either for the first time or you're revisiting us again, it's lovely to see you and I trust that you will be blessed as we come together to worship God. Uh, well, today is uh, the second Sunday of Lent. Um, we already are preparing ourselves for Holy Week, Easter time, uh, and of course as our, our theme for today is the words of Jesus, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, when he looked into Jerusalem as he was preparing to come to Jerusalem for his final week, and certainly some very important food for thought for us this morning. Before we hear or before we sing our opening hymn, our call to worship is taken from Psalm 36. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O Lord. With you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. And so we sing an opening hymn 120. God we praise you. God we bless you. before God in prayer. (coughs) 
It is the Apostle Paul that reminds us we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Our loving and gracious Father, uh, we come uh, this morning to worship you, seeking signs of your presence to strengthen us in our journey through life. We wonder how prepared we are to journey like Abraham did so many years ago, traveling into the unknown of, the, of your future. He looked for signs of your presence and journey on in hope. Confident that your presence was there to protect and to guide them. How much more fortunate are we? Blessed as we are with your presence with us in Christ, he undertook his journey towards the cross with a heavy heart, and in dying revealed his undying love for us all, blessing lives forever with his life and your love. We approach you, O God, this morning with hearts filled with awe over such undeserved gifts. And we pray that this time of worship will reveal the depth of our gratitude and praise. Loving Father, your ways are holy. They are good. And your love is strong and true. You are swift to answer those who trust in you, those who walk in your ways, and who make your living word their daily hope. Bless, we pray, our gathering this morning. Touch our hearts and our minds with the fire and the blessing of your sweet Holy Spirit. Grant that our praise may be more than words, our prayers more than speech, our singing more than mere harmony. Teach us, comfort us, strengthen us, and lead us, and help us, we pray, to draw together with, with our minds focused in glorifying your name, and also as we reflect and we ponder about the needs of others. Our thoughts are continuing very much for the lives of those who have been caught up in conflict, not just in Ukraine, real and indeed present with us as it is, but also other parts of the world where there is suffering and conflict. Lord, we, we live in a very unhappy world, a world torn by war by conflict, as your word reminds us, the fruits of sin, our sin. Help us this morning, dear Lord, to confess our own individual sins before you. And may you grace us, dear Lord, with your love and forgiveness as we truly repent of them and we ask for your help today. So hear our prayers, we ask, loving Father as we bring these our prayers in the prayer that Jesus taught us to say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our day, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for him. Amen. <laughs> well, <clears throat> just for a, a few moments of time, it's nice to see uh, our representatives of the Sunday School, but really this is an address pretty much for all of us together here today. And I wonder as to whether everyone can be involved with me this morning in trying to list a number of names that, for example, we have given to Jesus. Okay, so 
you know, if you can think of names that we might give to Jesus, well, Jesus was his name, like Benjamin is my name. So that was Jesus' name when he was alive, of course. The what other names were given to him that it might be of interest to all of us today. So, who wants to be first? What you're thinking, if, if you know the answer or any name, just tell me, shout it so that everybody can hear it. Any of the adults would like to sort of start the list? Messiah. Messiah, yes, that's good. What was that? Father. Prince of Peace, yes. Shepherd, yes. Savior. Savior, yes. Friend. Friend, yes. Teacher. Teacher, yes. Son of God, everybody agrees with that? Yes. Emmanuel, God with us. That, remember, that's the title that we are reminded of during Christmas time. Word of God, yes. You're all nodding very well this morning. It's great to see that. <laughs> Lamb of God. Yes, and of course, King of Kings, and there is many others of, as well. But what if, what if this morning I tell you the name of Hen? H-E-N, you heard me right. A hen, hen. Have you never come across Jesus being described as a kind of a hen? As a hen. Yes, of course. Do you know... That as Jesus traveled to the city of Jerusalem, there is a little verse in the Gospel of Luke, which is our reading for the Gospel for um, this morning, when it says, and this is Jesus saying these words, how often, as he looked into Jerusalem, he said, how often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. So Jesus was comparing himself to a hen. Interesting, isn't it? Does anybody know what that meant? What do you think Jesus meant by that? Jesus was simile. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? He's using a simile. A simile, well, that is a very grown up answer that. <laughs> what a clever girl you are. Indeed. <laughs> but I want you to unpack the simile. <laughs> I want you to tell me what you think the we simile might mean. What do you think Jesus meant to compare himself to a hen? He's guarding us. <laughs> That's right. Looking after us. is guarding us. In other words, in a, Jesus wants us, all of us, to gather together so that we can feel and experience His love towards us, okay? And that's why, grown-ups and children, that's why it's so very important that we come to the house of God to worship as a community. That is why the church lives and is for. He is the head of the church. Remember, that's another name, not a title. So in a sense, he, he wants us to gather together. He wants to love us as his children, just like a hen loves her chicks, and to be safe under his protection. Now, how does that make you feel when you hear that? That's right, Marian. It makes you feel good, doesn't it? It certainly makes me feel very good to know that I am deeply loved by Jesus. And that it doesn't matter how difficult life at times can be. Whether ill health or whether problems out with my life or troubles or, or whatever. And they are there because we all experience them. It doesn't matter. We can still know that God's love is still with us. And this happens every time we come together for worship. We feel the love of God. We ought to feel it, because our hearts ought to be open to love Him too. And as we love Him, we experience that. So, can I encourage you, um, our lovely girls this morning, and indeed all of us here today, 
Let us look for opportunities this morning and in the coming day, in the coming week, in the coming months. Let us look for opportunities to be close to Jesus. A chick needs to be next to the mom to feel that love, isn't it? A chick that basically goes in wonders will have a problem or two on the way. And we are no different. God wants us to be close to him. Don't go AWOL to use the army parlor. Don't go absent without leave. Come to God. Come to the church, to those who are listening online, who have yet not come into the threshold of the sanctuary over the last two years. Come and worship God. Be together with the rest of your brothers and sisters in Christ. And let Christ our Savior, the type of Him or Him that basically loves us and wants us to be together under the care of His love. So, I think I'll leave it at that, don't you think? All right. So, why don't we sing a song then, okay? Testament reading this morning is Psalm 27, a prayer of praise. The Lord is my light and my salvation, I will fear no one. The Lord protects me from all danger, I will never be afraid. When evil people attack me and try to kill me, they stumble and fall. Even if a whole army surrounds me, I will not be afraid. Even if enemies attack me, I will still trust God. I have asked the Lord for one thing, for one thing only do I want, to live in the Lord's house all my life, to marvel there at his goodness and to ask for his guidance. In times of trouble, he will shelter me. He will keep me safe in his temple and make me secure on a high rock. So I will triumph over my enemies around me. With shouts of joy I will offer sacrifices to his temple. I will sing and I will praise the Lord. Hear me, Lord, when I call to you. Be merciful and answer me. When you said, come worship me, I answered, I will come, Lord. Don't hide yourself from me. 
Don't be angry with me. Don't turn your servant away. You have been my help. Don't leave me. Don't abandon me, O God, my Saviour. My father and mother may abandon me, but the Lord will take care of me. Teach me, Lord, what you want me to do, and lead me along a safe path, because I have many enemies. Don't abandon me to my enemies who attack me with lies and threats. I know that I will live to see the Lord's goodness in this present life. Trust in the Lord. Have faith. Do not despair. Trust in the Lord. And a New Testament reading is from Luke chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. Jesus' love for Jerusalem. At that same time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, You must get out of here and go somewhere else, because Herod wants to kill you. Jesus answered them, Go tell that fox, I am driving out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I shall finish my work. Yet I must be on my way today, tomorrow and the next day. It is not right for a prophet to be killed anywhere except in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets, you stone the messengers God has sent you. How many times I wanted to put my arms around all your people, just as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not let me. And so your temple will be abandoned. I assure you that you will not see me until the time comes when you say, God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. And may God add his blessing to this, the reading of his holy word, and to his name but the praise and the glory, now and forevermore. Amen. And before we hear the message this morning, we turn once again to our hymn books, uh, hymn 22, The Lord's My Light and Saving Health. your Bibles, will you please turn to the Gospel reading this morning from St. Luke chapter 13 and the section verses 31 through to 35. Let us pray. O Lord, your word is a lamp to our feet 
and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith and love, and give us your strength and the courage to follow on the path you, set, you have set before us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. There are times when it would be rather nice and helpful to know what someone is thinking. In other words, it would be nice to, to know what goes through people's minds. Not always, but sometimes. Think about how nice it would be to know the thoughts and desires of a, of a baby who continues to cry even though you have changed their nappy and you have fed them, but they're still crying. Or think about how often men and women, husbands, wives, would like to know and understand what the other was thinking. There is a rather interesting book many years ago with the entitled Men Are From Mars and Women From Venus. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to know the difference, read it. It's rather comical at times, but they say maybe a little bit accurate. But in a more serious way, think about someone who has had recently a stroke and the inability to get words and thoughts to work together. How terribly sad and frustrating that is for the individual as well as for the family members who can't know what they are telling you and how they are feeling. And then, of course, there are the teenage years. You remember them? Which during this time, no one knows what anyone wants because they're all muddled up as we all were in our youth. Well, in our text this morning in Luke, we find the thoughts of three different views and thinking about the person of Christ. Okay, the Bible tells us quite plainly, and the Greek word "thelos," which I don't necessarily want you to necessarily remember too much, but nevertheless, you need to understand what the meaning of that word actually is. It basically means fixed desires, a firm and a settled motive and wish. That's the meaning of the word that is being given in the gospel to describe the kind of different views that are found in this section. Let me explain them to you. Herod's desire, Herod's desire to kill you. Jesus' desire, how often I would have gathered you like children, like a hen gathers her, her brood. And the desire of the people of Jerusalem, you would not. So verses 31, Herod desires to kill you. Verse 34, how often I would have gathered your children. This has Jesus' desire. And then the people of Jerusalem, verse 34, you would not. So what does that mean? Herod's desire to kill Jesus. The first disclosure of that desire is found in verse 31. The Pharisees come before Jesus and he tells them, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. Now Luke's gospel doesn't mention the Pharisees' motives. It may have been heartfelt. The Pharisees may have heard of a plot against Jesus and wanting to harm him. Or on the other hand, their motives may have been more sinister. Maybe they were threatened by Jesus and wanting to move on Jesus from their midst. And therefore get away from here for Herod wants to kill you. Regardless of the motives behind their words, one thing is for sure. The words were true, for Herod certainly hated Jesus. Herod already, if you remember, already had executed John the Baptist. 
He is the one who got rid of him. He is the one who authorized the beheading of John the Baptist. This man, the same man, it was Herod's father, Herod the Great, who tried to kill Jesus when he was an infant. Do you remember? Joseph and Mary, they had to flee for their lives. And he proceeded to kill all the children below the age of two. Cruel man, cruel family, resorted to violence at every given opportunity. You know, I'm always reminding of the cruel men of today like Putin and others who have preceded him. Cruelty is not a new thing. Herod was as cruel as cruel could be. He wanted to kill Jesus. You see, Jesus was a threat to Herod authority and for very good reasons. Don't forget Jesus claimed to speak the word of God. Jesus talked openly about man's sins. Jesus said he could not come to, no one could come to God except through him. You see, Jesus, uh, Jews believed that you could only come to God by being a Jew. If you were not a Jew, well, hard luck. <laughs> you had it. But Jesus came to confront that idea. He became the savior of the whole world, certainly to those who believe. Jesus was the one. And certainly the people at the time, including Herod, they could not come to terms with that message. The truth is, is that Jesus rocked the boat. He turned their world of thinking upside down. Well, my friends, as I was preparing this sermon, as I was reflecting on this particular reality, some things have no change. It's interesting, interesting indeed, that many people today within our culture, literally, either they are ignorant of Jesus, they are dismissive of Jesus, they even hate Jesus and all that he stands for. So if you want to use the word cancel, it was already in existence during Jesus' time. But they were more violent. And they were violent. Today we want to cancel and get rid of Jesus, of his ministry, of his teaching, of his church. The Christian message. We live in a world where people want God to do their bidding. People don't want to submit to God's authority because they, it doesn't suit them and to follow his commandments. It was Sinclair Ferguson, the Scottish theologian and minister of Scotland, great man of God, is worth reading every single line that he writes. But one of the things that he said recently was, people don't want God's will because it is not their own. In other words, my friends, many people have a problem with God's will because you don't want your will. Or maybe it's not your will or my will. And I think this is the conflict, isn't it? The notion that Jesus is the only way to heaven is considered narrow-minded, not inclusive. Key words today, not embracing. Or people want to hear that everyone is right in their own way. The truth is relative. If you think the truth is one thing, that is truth. In other words, truth is not objective anymore. It's not real anymore. I'm sort of half expecting someone to tell me, you know what, two and two, or two plus two equals five. Because I think so. And you will have many people pandering to that idea. So today, we're having people coming with all sorts of weird ideas as truth. I'm not going to preach about that today, but suffice to say that that highlights the problem and the dilemma. This is why Herod wanted to get rid of Jesus, because it just did not suit his agenda. 
And my friends, today we are having too many agendas which are not godly. And this is the challenge to all of us as Christians. Jesus did say, there is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. I remember when Pilate, you remember when Pilate asked Jesus in John 18 verse 38 when he was being tried. It's interesting, isn't it, how Pilate was trying Jesus in his own kangaroo court. Failing to realize that one day in the future it will be Pilate himself who will be standing trial before the judge and the king of kings. The irony of it. And yet it was Pilate who said to Jesus, when he was talking about truth, he says, what is truth? What is it? Failing to understand the truth itself was, was steering, was facing him all the way. For Christ himself is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And listen to this. No person, no man, no woman, including you and I, no one will come to God the Father on the final day except by me. That is the challenge. That is the task. That is the warning to everyone today. Jesus represents the God of truth who created and upholds the world that he has made by the power of his word and the magnificence of his sovereignty. He is the one that we should come to worship this morning. And therefore, motivated by this certainty, notice that Jesus is not shocked, nor even upset by the threat from Herod. On the contrary, his response is clear. Go and tell that fox. Delivered words. I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. You know, today when someone is called a fox... It's almost a kind of a positive message, isn't it? Wow, that is a foxy lady. Or what a, he is a fox of a man, isn't it? In other words, he is good looking. I think that's what it means. Would that be right? You who are properly educated, you know, you may wish to teach me a, a Spaniard, you know. Is that what it means? I think it means that, isn't it? All right, well, certainly not here. It doesn't mean that. And the reason is obvious. A fox may be physically beautiful, but it is a vicious, sneaky, tricky, and unrelenting predator. The fox will always leave a trail of destruction and death and in its wake. And that's the paraphrase that Jesus, in a sense, is is saying to the Pharisees, go and tell that vicious predatory old fox that I am occupied with other matters today and tomorrow. But remember this, the third day will come. In other words, no matter how threatening the world might be today and tomorrow, life's cruelty will not last. Resurrection is coming. Friday is here. But Sunday is coming. Friday Jesus died, but Easter Sunday is coming. Today I die for the sins of the world. On good, on Sunday I will be raised by the power of God to forgive all the sins and give life everlasting to everyone who believes. That is the message that Jesus sent to Herod. I remind, I remind myself of the Scottish minister and theologian William Barclay, who recounts the story of Hugh Latimer. I don't know whether you have heard of Hugh Latimer. Well, Hugh Latimer was the Bishop of Worcester, who, was promote, who promoted the cause of the Reformation in the times of King Henry. He was burned at the stake with Nicholas Ridley 
on the 16th of October 1555 in Oxford. And he was killed under the rule of Bloody Mary, the Catholic Queen. And he was martyred along with three other martyrs of the Anglican Church. But on one occasion, one Sunday, Latimer was, upon, was about to preach at Woodminster Abbey when King Henry was in the congregation. And as he climbed the pulpit, as I did here this morning, he mused to himself, and maybe I should say that to myself sometimes, Latimer, 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 be careful what you say. The King of England is here. Which is probably what someone may have said to him before he entered the pulpit. You know, Session Clark would do that. You know, Benjamin, behave. Someone is here, you know. <laughs> Not really. But nevertheless, I could almost imagine that sort of kind of idea going on. Well, however, Hugh Latimer went on to say to himself, and I quote, Latimer, 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 be careful what you say. For the King of Kings is here. And I think you get the message, don't you? My friends, we are always in the presence of the Holy. You may not realize it. You may not even be aware of it. But when two or three are gathered together, say Jesus, I am there in their midst. And my friends, we might be depleted in this congregation today, like many other churches are across this country. Tragically so. But don't despair, for Christ is here. And so the desires of Herod may have been real, but I want you, my friends, to understand that we are reminded that God's sovereignty is over history. Our time are in his hands. His plans and purposes for life are in his hands, including your life and mine. From beginning to end, your birth and future death, even moment, minute and second, every incident and experience, every trial, every blessing, every sadness, every joy. God is sovereign. God is in control. God is powerful and God is here to remind you of it. Five more minutes and I'm through. The desire of Herod. But then consider Christ's desires to gather Jerusalem together. He set his eyes towards Jerusalem because he knew the fate that awaited him just a few days hence. And why? He is facing that future because he is committed. He is courageous. He cared for the people. He cared for Jerusalem. We have read the words of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you. How often, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. It is rather interesting to note that some cities will forever be linked to things that happen in those cities. New York will forever be associated with 9-11. Beijing in China, always associated with the Tiananmen Square uprising in 1989. Munich, Germany, associated with the death of Olympic athletes as a terrorist act. Normandy and North Africa, uh, North uh, France, will always be associated with the D-Day invasions. And Berlin will be associated with the Berlin Wall. Jerusalem, however, at the time of Jesus, was known as the place where the prophets of God were killed. I think if I would have been in the time of Christ or even before that, I probably would have died a long time before ago. People would have got rid of me because I don't fit, maybe, the agenda. Jesus did not fit the agenda either. His repetition of Jerusalem, Jerusalem is a way of conveying intensity and passion. It was such a city of great potential. The city of David, the temple of God, the center of the Jewish faith. And yet, and yet, 
As a mother would, would want to protect her chicks, you have rejected me. You do not want me. And yet the teaching of the Bible is so very clear. Think about all the people Jesus reached out. Think about how he washed the feet of his disciples. Think about his declaration of forgiveness to the thief on the cross. Think about Jesus ministering to tax collectors, prostitutes, lepers. Thinking about how Jesus stopped to care for grieving parents. He reached out to those the world considered to be foolish. My friends, to all of them, Jesus ministered. But here is the tragedy of it all, and with this I finish. The crowd's desire, not willing. What a tragedy, isn't it? Not willing. Sadly, Jesus says about the people of Jerusalem, but you were not willing, you were not interested. And this, my friends, is one of the saddest and deepest mysteries of life, that the sovereign God, the one who ordains everything, who draws believers to faith, who also gives human freedom to turn to him or away from him, though we may not be able to fathom how these two things fit together, it is the clear teaching of Scripture. We must decide, all of us, whether we will allow Jesus to be our Savior or whether we will take the way of Herod and reject him. It's our choice. It is our choice. It was C.S. Lewis who once said, in the end, I, in the end of life, at the end of time, there will be two groups of people, two. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God will say, thy will be done. You see, some people say, how is it that good God could send people to hell? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Well, the answer to that is that God doesn't send anyone to hell. People do. By their choices. And that is the real challenge to all of us here today. It's a passage of a choice. A clear point. We can choose to be like Herod and the people, or we can basically come to him in repentance and faith. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often hear the appeal of Jesus' heart. How often have I longed to gather you around me Together, as a hen gathers her chicks, her brood. But you will not want to. That's the tragedy. May God help us this morning not to turn Jesus away. And may our desire be yes to Christ. Yes to him. Not just today or once a week. But every single moment every single second of our lives. To God be the praise and the glory for this is word. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious and loving God, in your holy word today we heard that you call us to you, that you ask us to come, that you seek us like a hen seeks out her chicks, that you offer us the protection and the safety of your strong wings. O oh, help us, O oh, Father, to stop each day and to listen for your call, to pause and allow you to overtake us, to wait and to have your warmth and your wisdom overwhelms us. Loving God, we stop here today to think not only of ourselves and our needs, but we also pause to think about the needs of others. You hold before you those whose cups are filled with bitterness and anger, those who have lost their way and who, whose worship is perhaps idols or even the things of this world. Lord, we pray that we will love you more than anything else, 
Help us, dear Lord, to hear your call. Help us, dear Lord, to, res to respond to that call and to come in faith and humility and indeed to worship you as we ought. We continue to pray for world leaders today, Father, for compassion, for strength and wisdom to guide their choices. Hear our longing that leaders will honor indeed the worth of every single individual. Help us, dear Lord, to seek dialogue and to seek peaceful means. We pray, dear Lord, that you will grant us all a sense of compassion, a sense of care, a sense of love, and indeed a burden to pray and a burden to help. And so, Lord, we pray for those people who are far and wide, who are going through this crisis in Ukraine, but also pray for other parts of the world where exist trouble and conflict, death and hardship. We pray within our own communities as well, conflict in homes, separations behind walls, issues of family tensions. We pray for those fathers who are grieving, for those who are anxious and worried, for those who are fighting illness, for those fathers who are crying because a loved one has just died. Lord, we pray, have mercy. Embrace them in your care, Father, we ask, and may you comfort them as we pray that you will comfort us as we come before you this morning. In the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, as our Lord, who indeed bid us to come to him. We ask this in his name. Amen. And so we come to our final, uh, to, to our final uh, hymn of our service this morning. It is hymn 554, uh, Rock of Ages, Cliff for Me. Christ Jesus has made us his own, 
Press on towards the goal of knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection. Press on to that outward call of God in him. Go in peace, love and care for one another in Christ's name. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always.